My father and I never agreed about anything, particularly politically. He was very right wing. And yet, in 43 years that I knew him, we never quarreled. Nor did I with Senator Gorham. Though he was far too awesome to quarrel with. But on the other hand, my mother was a virago. And uh, the only way I can handle her in the memoirs, and it's be I think it's going to work, is as a character of great comedy. I mean, here, she's a real honest to God, lush, 1920s flapper. Let's face it, I'm the guy who gives a shirt off his back. She loves to see the sort of butch talk, you know, as though she were a man. Uh, I'm the guy, this. And she has always done so much for others, and others have always let her down. Well, the more I keep doing the dialogue, because I, you know, I, I it starts to come back to me, I am in stitches. I mean, she is so funny, inadvertently. On the other hand, I used to think, how on earth did I get stuck with this as a mother? You know, that, that was a bit of bad luck. You might say I had a moment of self-pity in my early adolescence, but I soon got over it. And then I solved it by um, refusing to see her the last 20 years of her life. It was a great burden off my back. In 1935, my father and mother were divorced. I arrived here in November 1935. My mother had just married Hugh D. Orkincloss, who had just remodeled what was then a fairly new house. And I can remember the smell of the raw paint and the wet plaster. Everybody had a headache. The dining room is the same size and shape that it was. I remember my stepfather, Hugh Auchincloss, was a great fisherman, and over at the fireplace, he had an enormous marlin that he had caught, this hideous fish with, you know, a long sword on it. And the quarrels that went on for eight years between him and my mother over that fish to get that damn thing off the wall, she said, it spoils dinner, but he wouldn't take it down. The fish is now history. My first memory of the house, we came out at night, and I got up in the morning, as 10-year-olds do, at about 7 o'clock, and I went exploring around the place. I came back in, and what should I find? Sitting right here in this spot was my mother after her wedding night. I never remember what anybody wears, but she was wearing a gray silk dressing gown with a red border, looking rather disconsolate. And she said, do you like it here? And I said, well, we just got here. I can't tell. She said, would you, would you like it if I went back to your father? And I knew that even at 10, I knew that wasn't going to be possible because he was far, far away. And I said, well, I don't know. <clears throat> Apparently, the wedding night and the marriage proved to be a disaster. However, she stayed married to Auchincloss for six years, seven years, and had two children by him, who were, I think, born in this house, certainly brought up on the third floor. But I've often rethought in memory the figure of her on these stairs, wondering what to do, and already wondering how to get out. That was my bedroom for about six years when I lived here. After I moved out, my mother divorced Mr. Auchincloss, and then he married a lady who had two daughters, one called Jackie, one called Lee. And then that Jackie moved into my room, found some of my old shirts, which she said she used to wear when she went riding. Then she married Jack Kennedy, and they came back after their honeymoon, and they stayed in that room. We would show it to you, but unfortunately, it's now a closet. It's odd what you dream about. Most people have this, the same experience I do, that you dream about places that you grew up in. 
I dream of this river. I have a recurring dream that I am running at great speed through these woods, over the rocks, down to the river, to the bottom, where we're always told not to swim. It's very dangerous, so we always swam there. And the scene between Bob Ford and Jim Willard and the city in the pillar took place right down there. Abruptly, Bob pulled away. For a bold moment, their eyes met, then deliberately, gravely. Bob shut his eyes and Jim touched him as he had so many times in dreams without words, without thought, without fear. When the eyes are shut, the true world begins. As faces touched, Bob gave a shuddering sigh and gripped Jim tightly in his arms. Now they were complete. Each became the other as their bodies collided with a primal violence, like to like, metal to magnet, half to half, and the whole restored. This is about the only thing left of the ill-named Merrywood that is still the same. This is the pool house. And there used to be a swimming pool here, which it seems to have gone away. I'm not particularly autobiographical as a writer, but when I came to write Washington, D.C., I used houses that I had grown up in. I used Merrywood, which we've just seen in its current version, and also the house of my grandfather in Rock Creek Park. The pool house is emblematic to me of the book, and maybe of my life. It begins with an adulterous affair on the floor. That's his, that's hers, the dressing room. In the summer of 1937, and they're celebrating at Marywood up there, a big party to celebrate the defeat of Franklin Roosevelt in the Senate. They're all very right wing here. My own clans, the Vidals and the Gores, uh, I was brought up by the Gores, so I'm closer to them. I know them better. Once a year, the Gores have a meeting, usually in Mississippi. They govern practically five southern states. One of the cousins is currently vice president. Then the Kays, my grandmother's family, they're in South Carolina. Once a year, they have a reunion. And hundreds of people come. And we have a president there, an ex-president, Jimmy Carter. And these are support systems. In the absence of a republic, in the absence of governance, all we have is family. God's family. I'm Joy Gore, and I'm Mary Jane's sister, and my father is John Gore also. Um, I live in Clinton, Mississippi now, and I'm a computer specialist with the Veterans Administration. every few minutes what I think and I had not expected so much uh, musical talent in the family whose line my line T.P. Gore we are all of us tone deaf <laughs> I'm also kind of thrilled today to see so many variations of my nose here I had sort of thought it was all mine, and now I see that it's only on loan. <laughs> and that you will see to it that it keeps on going in various variations down the ages. But my grandfather came back here, some of you may remember, certainly you heard tell of in 1910. I remembered some of his sayings and his statesmanship. Anyway, he once said, if there was any race but the human race, I would go join it. He had a dark side to him, but I think today he would be properly pleased with the human race 
as of this warm afternoon. I saw T.P. I was a grown girl the last trip that I remember that he made back here. Mm -hmm. And he was just as sweet and good mm -hmm. as the, he was then. Yeah. But we all loved T.P. Well, he was a very funny man, I must He's say. He's a good man. Yeah. You knew how he became blind, didn't you? Well, you tell me. I know a, I know a story, but the, the, what how, was the first time is the one I'm vague about. Oh, uh, slingshot. A slingshot. Oh, he had told he, he told me he said about throwing nails at a cow when he was about eight. Then he said he went he was down in Jackson as a page to a state senator, mm -hmm. and he bought the other a boy birthday present of a gun that you pull the trigger and a spike would come out. Mm -hmm. Didn't go off. Held it up to his eye. It went off. And he said, I am blind, like that. Do we have many goals other than Al? Young Al. Young Al. Not on the national scene, no. Uh -huh. I liked him. Albert, I liked Albert Sr. Junior, I don't, uh -huh. I'm not so keen about. The populist movement, to which he and the whole Gore clan belonged, was rebellion against uh, the banks and against what they call the Bourbons, which were the old guard Democrats and the great planta planter families. It's curious that when he married my grandmother, he married into a planter family, proving, as the English uh, anthropologist Jeffrey Gora once said, all great men early in life commit hypergamy. Need I? do not need to translate the Greek, which means me marrying somebody above your social station. And I think T.P. Gore did that, and my father did that by marrying T.P. Gore's daughter. And the long line of hypergamists ends in me. Eudora, you as a watcher of people. One question that sort of passed through my mind that my grandfather, Senator Gore, was a, what they call a free thinker. And suddenly I'm surrounded by 200 relatives who really believe in our Lord. And up in that area, I mean, at every crossroads, there is a church, Baptist church, Methodist church. And this seemed to be, because I, I asked a couple, these are doctors, lawyers. These are not what they sometimes condescendingly call simple folk. They're very complicated. and well-educated people. And this thing was the center of their lives. And I just wondered, you as one who has lived here all your life, is this something new? Did this start with the TV evangelicals and Billy Graham? Has this been consistent? I think it's been consistent. Yeah. I think it's just part of yeah. life here, especially in small towns. It's the center of activity and so on. It's, I had a visitor from New York one time who said, I've just come through Midtown in Jackson and something must be the matter. I saw all these streams of people pouring into the churches. And I said, well, it's Sunday. That's all that's happened. I think it is part of the way of life. I don't think it's new. But maybe it was the occasion, you know, everybody getting together. And from all over. And sort of establishing contacts and getting the connections. But uh, we had eight hymns at the beginning. That's and a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. Luckily, only one chorus of each. But uh, one thing I, th I think, in fact, cause I have never seen the state of Mississippi before, and it was as green. I'm talking about uh, Chickasaw County and all, as I expected. But um, I did recognize some of the same. There was the Kentucky Fried Chicken stand, and there was yes, McDonald's. Yeah. Have you noticed that, that there's been more homogenization? Everywhere. Yeah, but I was thinking in a deeper sense, maybe, because mm. in those early days when nobody much left where they grew up, they really had certain aspects of character that you could identify with them. Like, everybody said, oh, those girls from the Delta, they're so fast. <laughs> you know, those girls from the... You can always tell a girl from the coast, you know, the high heels they wear and so on. <laughs> so we were forced to wear uniforms so that we couldn't see differences. But yeah. you could... By, by the way they did it, yeah, the way they arranged the collar. The way they spoke. 